take your Bible this morning, if you would, for our scripture reading to Luke chapter 6, please. Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, and we're going to read verses 36 through 42. Read them responsibly, begin together on 36, then I'll read 37, together on 38, and alternating like that till we end together on verse 42 of Luke chapter 6. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 36 of Luke chapter 6. Ready? Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, Pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them Can the blind lead the blind? And they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master. But every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceiveth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! Cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Lord, thank you already for the wonderful music today and for the good spirit in this place. And Lord, the beautiful sunshine, and it's just a good day to be in church. And thank you for each one that's made their way here. And Lord, we're uh, waiting expectantly to hear from the Word of God and for you to minister to our hearts. I pray you'd bless the special. I pray, Lord, that each of us, as we listen to the words of the song, would yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and that he would have free course in each one of our hearts and lives this morning. Bless the special to that end. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Never yet been 
told. I have found the joy no tongue can tell how its waves of glory roll. It is like a vast o'erflowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the heart has never yet been told. Amen. That's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music this morning. Thank you for a great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, Lord, I'm asking now for your help as we open up the only book you've ever written. And I pray, Lord, that thy Holy Spirit would speak to each of our hearts as we look at the pages of your word. We don't believe this to be the words of men or the words of a man. We believe this to be, in truth, the words of God. And I pray you'd take the truth today and help each one of us, Lord, that we would have a compassionate spirit and not a critical spirit. And so, Lord, direct us and help us as we share these truths this morning. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. The, there once was a widowed trapper who lived deep in the Alaskan wilderness he lived there with his two-year-old son, their faithful dog. On one occasion, the food supplies had run out, and the trapper was forced to go out and try to catch some more food. The weather outside was very fierce, and so he reluctantly decided he'd have to leave his son behind and trusted to the care of their faithful dog. While he was outdoors getting the food, the weather turned even worse and more violent, and he had to take refuge overnight in a stand of trees. When he got daylight the next morning and he broke camp and headed home, he got to his cabin to find the door open, furniture overturned. Obviously, a fierce struggle had taken place. There was no sign of his son. And he saw his dog laying over in the corner, looking at him guiltily and blood all over his mouth. The trapper became deeply distressed and quickly in his mind, everything began, he began to see what had happened. That the dog, without any food, had turned on his son and killed him. Gathering his axe from his side, he killed his dog. He then set about searching furiously for some sign of what might remain of his son. He thought maybe there'd still be a faint chance that his son would be alive. And as he's searching the cabin, he heard a faint cry that was familiar to him. And went over to where the bed was and he tipped the bed up and there was his son under the bed unharmed, without a scratch on him, or any blood on him. The trapper, flooded with relief, gathered his son in his arms. And it was then, with his son in his arms, he turned around and looked in another corner of the cabin, and he saw a dead wolf laying in the corner of the cabin. And it was then he realized why his faithful dog had been covered with blood. His dog was the one who saved his son. You know, we can often be as wrong as that trapper was in coming to an opinion about a person or about a situation and how it all played out in our mind and be terribly off the mark in our judgment and terribly off the mark in how we assume things are. It reminds us how careful and merciful we ought to be in our judgments. 
because we could be terribly wrong. You know, we're that way in our society. We, we do tend to judge the book by its cover and make judgments on people based just on their appearance. We evaluate a person's attractiveness on a scale of 1 to 10. And we make judgments about people. And I want to talk to you today about what Jesus spoke of in this passage. And I think that is whether we're going to have a critical spirit or a compassionate spirit. A critical spirit or a compassionate spirit. A critical spirit is is where we have an attitude of uh, criticism. That's what, when the Bible has a small s, a spirit, it's your attitude. When the Bible says Daniel had an excellent spirit, uh, it's not talking to the, about the Holy Spirit, though the Holy Spirit's an excellent spirit. It is talking about his attitude. Daniel had an excellent attitude about things. When the Bible talks about a hasty spirit or a critical spirit, it talks about our attitude. And it's an attitude of criticism or fault-finding that seeks to tear other people down. Not uh, Somebody says, well, what about constructive criticism? Listen, constructive criticism is always given directly to the person's face. Never behind their back. Never trying to, uh, to tear down, but trying to build up. It's always expressed face to face. The person with a critical spirit usually likes to dwell on the negative and, and would, would rather see the flaws than the good in somebody. And that's an attitude we all have to be alert to. Jesus put it this way in one place in the Gospels. He said, beware, he told his followers, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The, the leaven, of course, he's talking about the, the, the doctrine, the teaching, the practice of the Pharisees. You know what the Pharisees... The Pharisees thought they were it. The Pharisees were, were, thought they were so, so close to God and so pious and so religious, no one else could ever be as good as they are. They felt like, they felt like I am right now. I'm, I'm two steps up and I'm looking down on you. That's how the Pharisees lived their life. They thought they were just a couple levels ahead of everybody else. And that they, they, they would wear a huge key around their, their neck and they, they, that represented the key of knowledge. That they held it. I, I know I know it all and you don't. That was a Pharisee. And, and Jesus is telling his followers, you better beware of that. Now if Jesus tells us beware of something, we must have a problem with it. So we could have a problem with thinking that we're better than somebody else. And we could tend to look down on others. And, and, and not have a very compassionate spirit, but become very critical in our spirit. You can be, you know, you can be right sometimes and, and, and take some of the facts that you think you have, but you can also be wrong at the same time you're right if your spirit is wrong. You can, you can point out, there's a world of difference between someone who comes into the pastor's office and says, Pastor, you mentioned this in your message. Can, can, can you explain that to me? And someone who comes into the pastor's office and said, I want you to know i got a real problem with what you said this morning. Huh? You understand the difference? One says, I, uh, teach me what you're trying to say with that. And the other is like, man, I'm ready to tear you apart. I've had through the years, I've had them all. That guy's come in some office says, I, didn't, I had one fellow come in the office one time, and he said, I didn't agree with a single thing you said tonight. I felt like saying, well, I said good evening. Was that okay? You know, maybe not. But, but you, you understand, it's, that's, that's that critical spirit that, that's so easy to get in. And when we get it, if we don't deal with our critical spirit, and boy, we're in a, listen, we're in a nation right now. We're in a country that is just seething with critical spirits, wanting to find fault with everything and anything. And if you allow that to creep into your Christian life, it's going to harm your walk, it's going to harm your witness, it'll harm your world. 
that you're in. You see, the world watches the believer. And the only, the only picture of Jesus it's going to get is from us. And, 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 and if, if we're critical and harsh and condemning in our speech, you know what they're going to think? That's the way their God is. That's the way their Savior is. And that's not the way our Savior is. That's, that's a false representation of who our God is. So Jesus gives some instructions here in Luke chapter 6. And I hope your Bible's still open there to where we read this morning. Luke chapter 6. And he's giving us, I think, three exhortations here against having a critical spirit. And the first thing I want you to notice is he gives us an exhortation to not have a critical spirit. Jesus says in verse 37, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now, uh, everybody in the room has either heard, heard it said, you've said it, or someone said it to you, don't judge me usually spoken by people who are doing something they know isn't right but they don't want anybody to tell them it's not right so the words are don't judge me okay that's not what Jesus is talking about it does not mean that there aren't times that we have to make judgments or evaluations about what's right or wrong in our life or the life of somebody else. But it, you see, it, it isn't that we just take a live and let live attitude. Well, whatever you do is up to you. Well, whatever they do is up to them. Hmm? Doesn't matter to me. No, it, it is supposed to matter to us. We are our brother's keeper. So when Jesus said he doesn't mean that we don't evaluate other people's actions, beliefs, or teachings. You can carry that to the extreme. I was reading as I was preparing this message, and there was a woman, a Christian woman, who was on a jury, and uh, after hours and hours of deliberation, it was obvious it was a, a, what they called a hung jury. They couldn't come to a, a, a unanimous decision because this woman, a Christian woman, would would not say that the fellow was guilty because the Bible says, judge not, that you be not judged. And so they had to have another trial. But that's not what Jesus is speaking of. The Bible says we're to recognize and expose false teachers. You can't judge that, you can't do that without making judgments. But the judgment isn't, the, the basis of judgment is not my opinion. The base of judgment is not your opinion or what you think. The basis of our judgment is God's Word. This is what, I'm not, we don't judge anybody. We're just holding the standard up and saying, how do you measure up with the standard? That's all you say. How do you measure up with the standard? This is, this is not us judging. That's God judging. That's God making that discernment and God making that call. The Bible says we're to judge sin and evaluate sin in our own life. And, and make sure if I judge myself, I won't have to be judged by God. If I deal with sin in my own life, God won't have to deal with the sin in my life. You understand? So it's not talking about that kind of judgment. Jesus is telling us here, I believe, is forbidding an unmerciful, critical, fault-finding evaluation of other people. That's why he preceded the verse 37 with verse 36. Be ye therefore merciful, uh, even as your Father also is merciful. The attitude of harsh condemnation. That's the attitude that hurts rather than seeks to heal and help people. And so we have to be very careful. We, we, you know, we live in a, in a fallen world. And I think you wouldn't have to say that. But, but seemingly we tend to forget that. Because it seems like we so easily find what's wrong in other people's lives. Like we've made a great discovery. But, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
There's none that doeth good. No, not one. And, and so all of us have fallen short. And, and it seems like it, it's not too hard to find problems in somebody else's life. That seems to be a fairly easy thing to do. And it's not new with us. I, I thought about Cindy Lay. I thought about you when I read this. There was a note in a magazine, and it said this, just in case you find any mistakes in this magazine, please remember they're put there for a purpose. We try to offer something for everyone. And some people are always looking for mistakes. <laughs> and I thought, well, that would work right there. I'm going to remember that next time somebody says, uh, this is spelled wrong in the bulletin. I'll say, well, we put that there for you, all right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <coughs> 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 Excuse me. So Jesus is simply saying, I think we're to respond to other people's shortcomings, other people's sins with mercy and compassion. What a, we, we can lovingly correct and lovingly try to help and encourage, but when we begin to look down upon them or tear them down with our words, then we're judging them in the way Jesus says we're not to judge. Then we've crossed the line to where Jesus says we ought not to be doing that. So, in fact, there's nothing wrong with overlooking faults. Do you know that? Love can cover a multitude of sins. Okay? Be careful that an unmerciful, fault-finding spirit doesn't find residence in our heart and in our life. Our goal is to build up people. Our goal is to build them up to be like Christ. And that means we have to be a people, we have to be a church that exudes mercy and kindness and forgiveness to other people, especially when they fall, especially when they sin, especially when they... Listen, I want us to be the kind of church that people, when they have problems, when they have uh, difficulty, that they run to and not run from. I want to be the kind of Christian that folks will come to, not somebody they run from when they have a hard time, when they have a difficulty, when they understand that they've failed God. I don't want to be the condemning and the, the critical church, criticizing the weaknesses or failures of other people. I don't want to be the kind of church that shuns a sinner. Because we're all sinners. That, 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 that points a finger. And I point a finger, I got three more coming back to me. Don't forget that. And, and, and who of us could point a finger at anybody else? And so he's saying, he's telling us to be merciful. And, and we, if we forgive, we'll be forgiven. If we're merciful will receive mercy. And, and we, in other words, God says, I'm going to treat you the way you treat others. That's a, that's a frightening thought. It ought to be a motivation for us to make sure that we're treating others in the way the Lord would have us treat them. I need mercy from God every day of my life. I understand what I think it was Jeremiah who said in Lamentations, he said, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. God, God would have rubbed us out a long time ago if he weren't merciful. And that's every one of us. I need lots of mercy, so I better be willing to extend mercy to others. How many of you, when, when God evaluates your life, how many of you would... Would, would like God to be understanding, merciful, and gentle with you? Huh? I think we all would. Then couldn't we be understanding and merciful and gentle with others? And, and their situation in life? In prescription for a healthy mind, a psychiatrist named David Fink, he was with the Veterans Administration, he wrote this 
he said, quote, release from nervous tension. And he said for over 10,000 cases, he discovered there was a common trait with all of his patients who suffered from severe tension. They were habitual fault finders. Constant critics of people and things around them. Those who were free from tension were those who were the least critical. So his conclusions were that the habit of fault finding is a prelude or a mark of the nervous or the mentally unbalanced. He said those who wish to retain good emotional and mental health should learn to free themselves from a negative or critical attitude. Want to be healthier? Quit looking at the glass being half empty and start seeing it half full. Start, uh, quit looking at the negative and try to find the positive. That's where verse 38 comes in. We use verse 38 oftentimes in the context of just money. Give and it shall be given unto you. But as you see in this context, it's not talking about money at all. <clears throat> it's talking about mercy and forgiveness and, and compassion. And that's where God says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all it shall be measured to you again. Think about that in the context of mercy. If I give mercy, God will give back to me, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I'll receive mercy. If I give forgiveness, God says, I'll give forgiveness back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I like that. Jesus is saying we can be blessed and have our cup running over, so to speak. And His mercy and kindness will overflow in our lives. But notice what He said at the end of the verse. With the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Whatever you use to give that mercy, if you just, if you just give it in a, in a little teacup, that's how you'll get it back. If you give it out with a front-end loader, you'll, you'll get it back with a front-end loader. It'll be the same measure that you're giving it out, the same measure God will give it back. Now, it's going to be pressed down and, and shaken together. It's going to be packed in there for sure. But he's still using the same vessel the same measurement that you're using to give it out. So give freely. Give liberally. Give to others the mercy and the, the compassion and the grace that they should have. Grace, again, uh, we talked, I think we mentioned it Wednesday night about how we're to, we're, to, we're to speak to minister grace to the hearer. Grace is, grace is something that's undeserved favor. Because while well, I, you know, and, and are you like me? Is it, is it hard to give somebody a compliment when they're fishing for a compliment? Are you that way? I feel like when someone's wanting that, I, there's something in me that says, I don't want to tell them that because that's what he wants. You know what grace says? Grace says, give them the compliment. Ah, they don't deserve it. Grace. Grace. Minister grace to the hearer see let your speech always be seasoned with grace you be able with grace seasoned with salt we're also our speech is always supposed to be gracious you have to tell people what they deserve when you're when the when the waitress is not very good and the service isn't very good at the restaurant how do you respond are you gracious Or do you, I, I, I get so frustrated when every now and then something will surface online and you'll see that somebody wrote in, you know, they gave a stingy tip and said, you know, because uh, sometimes it'll say on the, on the checks now they have what 10% is, 15% is, 20%. They'll give suggested amounts and somebody will write on there, God only gets 10% and they'll give the waitress like 8%. Yeah, I want to find that fella and in mercy choke his neck. But, uh, huh? oh, listen, that's not gracious. That's not gracious. What kind of, uh, 
What kind of an effect would it have for someone to write a note and say, I, you must be having a hard day. Maybe this will be a blessing to you. And leave, leave as much tip as what the bill was and try to be a blessing to somebody. Hmm? You never know what that would do. And then I'll guarantee you, you put a gospel track with that, somebody's going to look at it. Because you've impacted their life with grace, with mercy, with compassion. So, perhaps somebody allowed somebody hurtful or somebody who's offensive to you come into your life. Not that, not that they'd be a burden to you, but they could be a blessing to you. So you could extend mercy and you could extend grace and compassion because God knows God knows what's coming down the road and God knows you're going to need His mercy. And God's giving you opportunity to get your measurement out and give mercy to somebody else so that when this trial comes down the road that He knows is coming, He can pack that mercy in and have it ready for you. With the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. That's the exhortation not to have a critical spirit. Then he also gives us a warning not to be around people with a critical spirit. And that's one way you don't get a critical spirit. Don't hang around people who have one. Verse 39, a par he spake a parable on them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. I'm not going to go into all that that can mean. That can be a message in itself. But he's simply saying if you're following a blind fella and, and a blind lead the blind, that's not, they're, they're, they're both going to fall into trouble. They're both going to get into the ditch. And if you hang around the people with the critical spirit, you're going to end up with the critical spirit. You follow somebody who is uh, uh, harsh and judgmental, you're going to end up harsh and judgmental. You, you become like the people that you run with. You won't, you won't be who you want to be. You'll be like the people you hang around. The people you choose to be around. That's who you'll be like. And somebody says, well, I'll, I'll listen to them, but I won't be like them. Uh, you'll be like them. How many parents, you've learned the fact, uh, you've learned that it's a waste of breath to tell your children, now do as I say, not as I do. Huh? Your children will not do as you say, they'll do as you do. They'll do as you do. So you, you, you have to understand, a student is not above his teacher. The disciple is not above his master. That's why Psalm 1 says you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, because you'll become like the people you are around. The learner will become like the teacher. If the teacher is critical, and the teacher is fault-finding, and the teacher is, 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 is harsh, the student will be the same way. Then he talks about the well, well, we'll get into that probably with the next point about the mode and the beam. But listen, uh, you're not going to rise above the people you hang around. And by the way, whether that's, whether that's people that are flesh and blood with you or whether that's people on a screen or music you're listening to, people who are you allowing to have influence in your life. Yours are, I, I, I can't, I don't remember the last time that I've listened to more than an hour of either uh, any conservative talk radio. You know why? It's affected my spirit. And, and I didn't like the effect it was having on my spirit. And so I don't listen. Uh, very little. Very little. And, 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 and it changes my spirit you see because I was hanging with the people who were being critical with their spirit and it was making me critical 
And that isn't how I want to be. All right? And so uh, don't have a critical spirit and don't listen or hang around those with a critical spirit. And then, then he talks about how foolish it is to have a critical spirit in verses 41 and 42. <clears throat> he says, Why do you behold the mote that's in your brother's eye and perceive not the beam that's in thine own eye? And how canst thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye when thou boldest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to pull the, out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. You know the situation here, that it's, it's so easy. And, and basically the Lord is saying, other people's faults seem so easy for us to see, and ours seem so difficult, even though they're glaring to everybody else. The, 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 it's really kind of funny what the Lord has said here. He said there's a moat. A moat is almost like a speck, almost like a, a little flake of sawdust maybe. In, in somebody's eye. And here I am with a beam, like a, a long uh, truss of a roof or a big, you know, think of a long two by four, Tim, like just sticking out of my eye. And I'm looking and saying, You got a speck in your eye, buddy. It'd be hilarious. You say, Man, don't you see this big wooden thing sticking out of your eye? No, I don't see that. And isn't that true? Isn't it so easy how hard it is to see our own faults? And boy, we sure can't point them out in everybody else. Sure can't find out what's wrong with everybody else, but I, I don't see anything wrong in my life. And that's what Jesus is saying, how hypocritical we are. Imagine, I mean, imagine if, imagine me going up to Dean Blake and saying, Dean, I got some tips for you on how you can lose weight. <laughs> exactly. Huh? You say, man, what are you talking about? Huh? You, wouldn't, you wouldn't go up to LeBron James and say, hey, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about how to be a better basketball player. Huh? I wouldn't, you wouldn't go to Warren Buffett and say, I'd like to give you my tips on investing. It's, it's ludicrous. Saying, man, you, <laughs> you don't know who you're talking to. And you're so easy to see someone else's. Uh, we, we all tend to exaggerate the errors in someone else's life and minimize the wrongs in our own life. We all tend to do that. And Jesus is warning us about that. Some of you remember the comic strip Peanuts, Charles Schultz. Linus asked Lucy one day, why are you always so anxious to criticize me? And Lucy said, I just think I have a knack for seeing other people's faults. <laughs> and then Linus says, well, what about your own faults? And Lucy says, well, I have a knack for overlooking those. <laughs> That's most of us, isn't it? See, it's only when we honestly look at our own lives that we have any possibility of trying to help somebody else. We honest evaluation of our own life. And, and Jesus said, get the beam out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye and to help them. Evaluate your own life and see if you're dealing mercifully and honestly and lovingly with other people. Don't, 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 Allow a critical spirit to take over. Let me tell you how you get one. Say, how, do, how does my spirit get critical? Let me just give you several things. And just, just write, jot them down and think about them later. Prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. You know, it's, it's awful difficult to be critical when you pray. When you pray, you focus on Jesus Christ. You talk to him. You come boldly to the throne of grace. It's, you won't be a person of continual prayer and a person of continual criticism. They can't go together. Carnality. Number two, carnality. And it simply means fleshly. Living for yourself. Not, not, not 
dying to the flesh, but feeding the flesh. The flesh is against the spirit. These two are contrary one to the other. <clears throat> Carnality. You get critical when you get too familiar. Familiarity. They use, there's an old saying used to say familiarity breeds contempt. Pride. Pride comes a lot when you get into the performance Christianity. Well, I perform. In other words, hey, hey, I'm, I'm better than you because I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, choir practice, Friday night. I'm, I'm here all the time. I'm better than you are. Huh? That's pride. That's pride, thinking you're better than somebody else. Amen. Ingratitude. These are things that, that, that will lead us to having that critical spirit. When you forget or you don't see God's blessing in your life, then you become critical. See, ingratitude will lead to covetousness. You think, well, how come they got that? I don't get anything. Yeah, God did that for them. He never does anything for me. Was well, that right? Pretty sure you're breathing. Pretty sure you slept somewhere last night. Pretty sure you have somewhere to eat today. Or something to eat. You got, you got a roof over your head. Think about it. You got clothes on your back. You're in church on a Sunday morning. How can you say God's done nothing for you? Hmm? Pride. Ingratitude. Be grateful. Now in closing, let me just give you a few steps here to how to overcome a critical spirit, just in case. Just in case you might know somebody else who has a critical spirit. You, you'll be able to help them, okay? Number one, repent. Repent. Repentance in the Bible is where you agree with God about it. <clears throat> it's not just saying, I'm sorry. It's where you agree with God. When the Bible says if we confess our sin, it's a word that means I take the same position as God. That's why the very first principle in Reformation Animus is if God's against it, so am I. It's got to get you to see your addiction, your problem, the same way God sees it. Because we all tend to think, well, yeah, I got this issue, but it's not that bad. And we have to see it the way God sees it. And so we repent of that. Agreeing that God says it's wrong and asking God to forgive me. And repentance means I'm turning from it. I'm turning from it. I'm confessing and forsaking. Number two, realize that you'll have to engage in spiritual warfare. I believe... I believe the critical spirit is not just fleshly. I think it's demonic. I think it started with the devil. Yeah, yeah, did God really say, you that tree, you'll die? You aren't going to die. Huh? Criticizing God's word, wasn't he? God doesn't keep his word. You considered my servant Job? Yeah, let me have him. I, he won't. He'll, he'll curse you to your face. Well, that's a critical spirit, isn't it? Huh? So you have to have spiritual warfare. This kind, Jesus said, comes forth by, by prayer and fasting. Put on the whole armor of God. Number three, remind yourself of the grace that God has shown you. Instead of, instead of looking at what other people are missing or lacking in their life, would you remind yourself the times you've lacked in your life and God's been gracious to you? God's been merciful to you? Focus on how gracious God's been to you in your life and you can extend that grace to others. 
remind yourself of the grace God's shown you. And then number four, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Take repeated steps in the direction of the Spirit. That's, that's conscious. Like it's, it's, a, it's a yielding often throughout the day to the Spirit of God. Being conscious and aware. It's not, you know, one of the, one of the great dangers of, and, 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 and I just want to help you. I'm not trying to tell you not to, but to have a devotion time in the morning. You should. But don't do this. Don't have your devotion time in the morning and then you go and you get yourself ready and you go off to work and you do your work and you talk to people and you have your lunch and you do your other work and then you get done and you come home and you have dinner and you talk to your family and you go to bed and you get up and then you pick God up again and talk to him. You see? But you went all day and you never gave him another thought. That's not walking in the Spirit. Tell folks, sometimes the young people won't understand this, but some of you older folks will understand this. You know, it's when you get up in the morning and you, you get God on the phone, just, just, just cradle the phone, don't hang it up. Just cradle the phone and take it with you. The, the first wireless phone connection was between you and God before there ever was any wireless on earth, amen? You used to have a phone cord and you'd, uh, you'd phone in the wall and you'd walk around the kitchen. How many ladies walk around the kitchen getting dinner ready or doing things and have that cradle in your... You know, you used to do that. That's what you do. You just keep God all day long. That's how you pray without ceasing. That's how you take repeated steps in the direction of the Spirit. When things come up and people say things, when situations arise, you ask the Spirit of God to help you respond in the right way. That's walking in the Spirit, being aware of the Spirit at all times. And ask Him to help you to respond the way you ought to respond. Help Him. You know, the Bible never says, Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the faults of others. No, you'll be in perfect misery. And that's not the state, that's misery. You know what he said? You'll be in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Oh, keep your mind focused. Keep your mind fixed on the things of God, on God, on Christ, on the Spirit of God, and peace will come. A practicing lawyer loved to attack his opponents through scathing letters printed in newspapers. In 1842, he ridiculed the wrong man. James Shields did not take kindly to the anonymous writer who lampooned him in the Springfield Journal. Mr. Shields tracked down the attorney who had publicly embarrassed him and challenged him to a duel. The man was a writer, not a fighter, but he couldn't get out of the duel without losing his honor. He was given the choice of weapons and he chose swords in hopes of using his long arms to his advantage. To prepare for the duel, he practiced with a West Point graduate and prepared to fight to the death. On the appointed day, he met Mr. Shields on a sandbar on the Mississippi River. To the good of both men, Friends intervened and convinced the men not to do the duel. And the lawyer returned to his practice, but he was a changed man. He never again openly criticized anyone. In fact, years later, when he heard his wife criticize the Southern people during the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln said, don't criticize them. They're just doing what we'd be doing under similar circumstances. See, that changed Abraham Lincoln. 
and he would not be critical anymore. One of the don't listen to the lie of the devil that says you can't change. Yes, you can. God can change anyone. God can do anything. You just ask him to help you. Are you known for your compassion? Or are you known for your criticism? Are you known for your compassion? Or are you known for your criticism? Let's have a compassionate spirit, not a critical spirit. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning? Thank you for everyone's attention today. Lord, what you taught here in Luke 6 about being merciful, compassionate, not, not casting judgment upon people, not having that negative, harsh spirit. I pray, Lord, you'd remind us how merciful and kind and forgiving and gracious you've been to each one of us and that we would extend that to others. And folks would see the compassion and the goodness and the love of our God in our lives and how we love one another. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us today. If any in the room have never experienced your forgiveness of their sin and received your gift of eternal life, that they'd receive that gift today. For Lord, most of us here this morning are believers. We need to have a compassionate spirit. When you saw the multitudes, you were moved with compassion on them. You were always merciful. Help us to be merciful, kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. May we be known by our compassionate spirit for one another. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. wonder how many folks this morning could say, Pastor, if I died today, I know for sure that I'd go to heaven. I know that I'm saved. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment and say, that's me? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. Anybody here today would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that I've ever received God's gift of eternal life but I'd like to know that. Would you let me pray for you? Would you slip your hand up for a moment and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning? All right, the message is two believers today. I wonder how many believers would say, Pastor, you know, I've, I struggle at times with that critical spirit that Jesus spoke about. And I'm, I'm going to take the steps that you mentioned today to ask God to take that, replace that critical spirit with a compassionate spirit. Ask the Lord to help me with that today, Pastor. The Lord dealt with my heart. Here's my hand. Pray for me this morning. Will you slip it up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, we'll pray and we'll have your invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Then respond to him. Take the first step today. Just bow and say, Lord, I see it the way you see it. And I need your help. Please work in my heart. And just, just, you know what? Go on, a, go on a negative fast. Where you're saying, I'm nothing negative is going to come out of my mouth. I'm just going to have a negative fast. And do it for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever you know, long you, 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 Lord impress you to do it. And, and boy, it'll reveal to you just how critical you've become. And ask the Lord to help. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts this morning. Thank you, Lord, for decisions that have already been made in people's hearts and lives, and Lord, for dealing with each one of us through the message today. Surely all of us could be more compassionate. All of us could be more merciful. All of us could be more mindful of the grace and the mercy you've shown to each of us. None of us would be where we are today if it were not for your mercy and your grace. 
Thank you for loving us. Help us to extend that love and mercy and grace to others. Father, have your way in this invitation now. May each individual do exactly what you're telling them to do in their heart. Lord, if anybody's here today and they've never received Christ, may they come. If they're saved, never been baptized, I pray they'll come. If they're saved and baptized and they believe this is where they ought to belong and serve, I pray that they'd come this morning and say, we want to belong to Bible Baptist Church and serve the Lord here. Whatever it is in the, in the hearts of people, may they respond to you this morning. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, whether Bob's going to sing the invitation, God has spoken to your heart. Please respond to him this morning, will you? Oh, soul, are That's you right. weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you he promised Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Sing the chorus with him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Father, we do thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us, for speaking to our hearts. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's made their way here to the service. Dismiss us now with your care. Lord, I pray that you'll be with those unable uh, to be with us this morning because of sickness, illness. Please place your healing touch upon their bodies. Raise them up to be back with us soon. Give all of us a good Sunday afternoon. Remind us that it's the Lord's day and not just the Lord's morning. And bring us back for the service this evening, Lord, ready again for you to speak to each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.